Imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. Dystopia used to be a word solely used to describe the fictional worlds of our futures gone terrible and wrong. Science fiction is filled with stories of the apocalypse and survival in post-apocalyptic scenarios. But our reality has caught up with fiction. A billion people already live in conditions of such suffering and abomination as to rival any sci-fi dystopia. With the COVID virus, the rest of us have already played out one of the many negative science fiction fantasies of future disasters. The present and very near future holds multivarious possibilities of horror. But you know all about these. You know about the many forms of pollution, air and water and plastic waste islands in the ocean. You know about the effects of climate change, sea level rise and hurricanes and floods and droughts. You understand the negative effects of positive feedback loops, whereby climate change begets more climate change. Yes, the additional temperature rise melts the reflective ice of the poles to be replaced by dark water which absorbs heat, creating further warming and changing ocean currents. You are even aware of the dangers of permafrost melting. And the unleashing of new viral and bacterial disease. You also know about the rise of fascism in America, Brazil, Hungary and India and its attendant racism and other forms of nastiness. You worry that so many people appear to be living in an alternate reality to match their alternate facts. I agree with this. That's a misguided, twisted fanatic. Whatever your clocks say and wherever you are, it happens to be the Twilight Zone. Here is the Twilight Darling. Darling, is the wind blowing today? I'd like to watch television, darling. One of the great inventions in history is called TiVo. Not now, damn it. Are we morons? When the wind stops blowing, that's the end of your electric. Next week, an exercise in insanity. Yes, the relationship between knowledge and truth and power and ideology are part, an important part, of our present and future dystopia. You know a lot about the causes of all these things and more, but there are some things that make the situation worse that even you don't really know about. When I say you here, I obviously do not mean everyone. Some people are extremely ignorant because they are ideologically blinded and subject to huge amounts of disinformation and misinformation. Some are quite willfully ignorant and others have essentially lost all grip on reality. This is itself a part of our dystopian present and future. It may well be a partial cause of why we fail to successfully address our multitude of problems. But ignorance and knowledge are not absolutes. People are knowledgeable and ignorant to various degrees. Amongst those things I listed above, there are still levels of understanding concerning them. There are things you need to understand for us to have any chance of saving our children's futures. 
Social Theory Films presents 2023. What must be done? Chapter 1. Emergency. A red line of irreversible change, only five or ten years in the future, is the real emergency. Emergency consists of all those things you know about, but also, and this is what really makes it such an emergency, is the time frame for the full manifestation of the dire effects. With respect to climate change, for example, most people are not aware of just how near we are to irreversible tipping points. Nine out of the 15 big biophysical systems that regulate climate are now on the move, showing worrying signs of decline and potentially approaching tipping points. This time frame is nowhere near in sync with that of the cautious warnings we receive. If we keep on, the climate warming may reach X degrees by the end of the century or the global target agreements, the Paris Agreement of December 2015, for example, to restrict global warming to two degrees. The most ambitious of targets is to reach net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Other less ambitious plans target the end of the century. 2050? The end of the century? 2050 will be too late. The end of the century is a time human beings may well not live to see. There are many tipping points we shall likely live to see, long before then. It could be argued that the complete summer melting of the Northwest Passage was one such tipping point we have already passed. A complete blue ocean effect for the North Pole is another that is on the horizon. At the current rate of warming, the Arctic could lose all summer sea ice by 2030. It fits into a classic feedback loop of warming water melting more ice, begetting more warming water. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has warned of looming tipping points for Arctic, Greenland and Antarctic ice. It has warned of subarctic permafrost melt, savannification of the Amazon rainforest and other planetary environmental thresholds beyond which recovery may be impossible. We know how they will react to one another and create other possible feedback loops. or thin livable universe. Just a few kilometers below my feet, it's too hot to live. Just a few kilometers above my head, the air is too thin to breathe. It's not about a few more droughts and a few more storms. It's about a catastrophic shift in this fragile balance of our biosphere that threatens everything we love. The Greenland ice melt and the ice sheet sliding off of it could bring the Atlantic conveyor to a halt 
drastically altering Europe's climate. This would be alongside the anticipated sea level rise flooding of coastal cities. We do not know exactly how close we are to any of the tipping points, but we know we are close, very close. The point at which humanly caused climate change is irreversible could be as early as 2027. 2027. Now the IPCC's forecasts are less alarming. However, the IPCC, because of the nature of its structure, is inherently very conservative with respect to such things. Nevertheless, United Nations General Assembly President Maria Fernanda Espinosa Garcet warned in 2019 that 11 years are all that remain to avert catastrophe out of control and unstoppable global warming with all its attendant damaging effects. This graph shaped like a penis because it shows how fucked we are. This is where we are now. And as we can see, it's already pretty fucked with massive fires, floods, heat waves, locusts, bullshit. This is what scientists call the stop here or we're fucked point. And this is where we're currently headed, or as scientists call it, net fucked by 2050. The good news is we've promised to reduce our emissions. And if you take all our promises and add them together, that puts us on track for still very much fucked by 2050. And that's if we keep our promises. A big if since some of our biggest promises are being coke blocked by corporate coal shills, while others are nothing more than blah 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 or a plan printed on a pamphlet. Planflet? Our promises and planflets are also based on the hope that we'll offset our emissions with technologies which don't work or even fucking exist. Or with technologies that do work and exist. Like trees. Except trees need time to grow, which we don't have. And space, which we also don't have. Plus, trees can burn, which seems to happen a lot these days due to climate change. And when they do, they release all that carbon they captured. Which means the only way we can keep our promises is to stop emitting carbon. Are we doing that? God, no. We've been subsidizing it at a rate of $11 million per minute, which discourages investment in renewables by distorting the market. And that's why there's a huge gap between our promises and where we need to be. We don't talk about that gap because that would entail a complex process called being honest. Being honest would mean admitting that we're failing. And we can't do that because then we'd have to stop failing. That would mean ending fossil fuel subsidies and banning all new gas, coal and oil projects. And to anyone suggesting harming our precious children like that, we say, how dare you? So being honest isn't an option for us, which is why we've come up with the next best alternative. Net zero by 2050. Net zero by 2050 means that instead of being honest this decade by taking this path, we leave the being honest part to the last minute by taking that path instead. As you can see, both lead to net zero in 2050, but they're very different journeys because this path adds this many emissions to the atmosphere and that one one adds three times as much. And since emissions are what's causing the planet to warm, that means crossing the stop here or we're fucked point, which risks setting off irreversible chain reactions beyond our control. That's the exciting part of running an experiment with the only planet we know that supports life in, in the, the whole fucking universe. universe. Just so we can make a few billionaires even richer. Net, Net zero, zero by 2050. 2050. Anywho, feel free to take over from us at any time. Cause as you can see, we're captured by the fossil fuel industry, compromised by our moral failings and lack of vision and probably going to get us all killed. This has been a message from your local government franchise. Authorized by the department for blah blah blah. Net zero by 2050, blah blah blah, net zero, blah blah blah, climate neutral, blah blah blah. <laughs> this is all we hear from our so-called leaders. Words. Words that sound great, but so far has led to no action. Our hopes and dreams drown in their empty words and promises. Greta Thunberg was not the first to use the blah 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 phrase as part of a critique of the COP gatherings. She used it at COP26 in 2021, but blah blah blah, act now, was a left critical slogan for COP15, 
2009 in Copenhagen. No, they didn't act then, and they won't act now. But things are much worse than might appear to be the case, than merely the hypocrisy of noble words that are not acted upon. There are reasons why the politicians' words are not acted upon. There are powerful reasons why they will not be acted upon. There are reasons sufficiently powerful to easily overcome any attempt at shaming or embarrassment by a media-loved child. What is your response to her? She beat me out on Time magazine. Because that world, in case you haven't noticed, is currently on fire. But to embrace the possibilities of tomorrow, we must reject the perennial prophets of doom and their predictions of the apocalypse. We shall, in a later chapter of this film, look at some of the arguments proposed by Andreas Malm in his book, How to Blow Up a Pipeline. However, he lays out some relevant facts. There is a growing mismatch between current investment and production trends, and any movement toward the blah 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 stated goals of keeping warming below 1.5 or even 2 degrees centigrade. Investment in coal and gas and oil has not only continued, but actually increased significantly. 6% more capital per year, for example, has been sunk into new drills, wells and rigs. Investment in exploration increased by 18% in 2019. ExxonMobil has planned for production to increase by 35% annually until 2030. Shell by 38%. Total and BP, not quite so much, 12 and 20% respectively. To look at this from yet another perspective is another fact. 49% of current operating capacity of carbon-based units was commissioned after 2004. What this all means can be stated quite simply. We are not moving forward to mitigate the human causes for climate change. No, we are aggressively accelerating the process. When I say we in such contexts, I am contributing to a common obfuscation of the situation. We, as in humanity, are not doing this. We are not a homogenous group. It is capital that is causing the ongoing problem. Financial and carbon capital. The big players, a very small number of people, are making the decisions and bribing the politicians to make the decisions that might possibly end in the extinction of the human species. Here, I, I've got an experiment for you, safety glasses on. By the end of this century, if emissions keep rising, the average temperature on Earth could go up another four to eight degrees. What I'm saying is the planet's on fucking fire. There are a lot of things we could do to put it out. Are any of them free? No, of course not. Nothing's free, you idiots. Grow the fuck up. You're not children anymore. I didn't mind explaining photosynthesis to you when you were 12, but you're adults now, and this is an actual crisis. Got it? Safety glasses off, motherfuckers. You buy and drive a gas-guzzling SUV. You fly too often for both business and pleasure, then perhaps you need to. Too high a percentage of your diet is meat. So yes, you are playing something of a causal role in global warming. You could do otherwise. But it is not so easy. Oil, gas and SUVs are all subsidised. Fossil fuel business in the US is being subsidised by the federal government. Today, based on the pollution that is being produced by fossil fuel companies and industries, thousands of Americans are dying every year. Globally, it's the numbers in the millions, and we are doing that for the benefit of the owners of those fossil fuel companies and almost no one else. SUVs being relentlessly advertised as desirable. True costs are concealed.
it is simply part of the contemporary culture of the West to consume enormous quantities of meat. And this demand ensures the raising of cattle, the consequent emission of methane, as well as the clearing of the Amazon rainforest. The dangerous human activities of the carbon economy are all part of a system of structural causality. What can be done and what should be done to change things we should look at in chapter four. First though, we should look at another problem, another kind of related emergency. Chapter three, fossil fascism. We know that fascists do very nasty things. We know that they will destroy democracy and erode our freedom. But climate change? What has Nazism got to do with climate politics? Well, it has a number of things to do with it, actually. For one thing, fascism has a very strange relationship with science. It feeds the irrational and thus, its priorities are more short-term and short-sighted economic policies. Brazil's Bolsonaro is a case in point. Let us look at the essential bond between climate change and fascism. Fascism has other aspects to it, but racism is always a significant part of it. Climate change is, of course, a complex phenomenon, but it too has racism as a crucial component. There is a geographical dividing line with respect to climate change. Those nations most responsible for it, not only in the past, but in the present, and continuing into the immediate future, are to be found in the north of the planet. Those with the largest populations directly experiencing the most drastic effects of the climate emergency are to be found in the global south. It is a division of rich and poor, or core and periphery, to use world systems terminology. The past of climate change division is the past of colonized and colonizer, leading into the future of neo-colonial power relations. It is a crude and simple division, white and black, though of course we can add brown and red and yellow to the black category, as well as Muslims. There are of course blacks in the north and whites in the south, just as it is true that there are upper-middle-class blacks and Mexicans in the US and ultra-rich Muslim immigrants to be found in Knightsbridge and Kensington in London. The former are simply the exception that proves the rule, and the latter not the group of immigrants the racists are worried about. Climate change produces economic and political refugees, and it is immigration issues that most capture the imaginations of European and American fascists, the issues that provide their zeitgeist. But let us turn for a moment to a look at carbon capital. This will help us understand the fascist connection to the root of the climate change. Carbon capital has known about the link between fossil fuels and climate change for quite some time. It is known that what will be required is a deep, fundamental, structural change to mitigate the problem, and it fears this necessary change more than anything. It may be the case that a large shareholder or CEO of an oil company is aware of and concerned about the long-term effects of climate change, 
but as a member of a segment of capital, he behaves in conjunction with its imperatives. Carbon capital behaves in accordance with the prime directive of capital. All investment decisions must be based upon the profit motive and directed at the highest rate of return upon investment in the short term. What flows from this is a multi-pronged strategy of denial, at the same time as attempting to exploit all of the carbon to be found in the ground. So as they continue to invest heavily in carbon fuel production and exploration, they seek to obstruct any attempt to legislate against that resource exploitation and consequently must obfuscate any popular understanding of the issue that would restrict them. They can see that eventually we have to zero out on emissions entirely, and that means essentially wiping fossil fuel infrastructure off the planet. The bottom line is that this moment must be delayed as long as possible. The delay can be affected by apparently contradictory rhetorical strategies. Outright denial that climate change is happening, getting harder to maintain in the face of heat waves, forest fires and droughts, and accepting climate change's occurrence while denying the attribution of human causation. One would think this would also be harder to do, given the evolving knowledges of climate science. But this is not so. Faith in science and its institutions, in the existence and reality of actual facts, has been widely eroded as the science has become more refined. Truth generally has become clouded in a fog of irrationality. Perhaps the most extreme ideological belief flowing from this is the Panglossian notion that carbon emission is actually good for the planet, helping plants to survive and thrive. Carbon in the atmosphere is, is actually good. On the other side of the proceeding, is the ideological power of greenwashing. Here is Greta's blah, blah, blah. Net zero by 2050, blah, 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 net zero, blah, 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 climate neutral. Noble words and non-binding treaties, the COP21 Paris Agreement is a good example of such. To the word commitments, we could append the adjective inadequate. But no matter, even these weak agreements are not lived up to by the nation-state signatories. It doesn't matter that there are conflicting rhetorics. For a time, for example, we had Exxon aggressively funding outright denial, while BP and Shell accepted reality but put forward a greenwashed fantasy. The results were the same practice in either case, a continuation of business as usual in terms of investment and production, with the gases continuing to be emitted. The liberal, neoliberal polis has taken the greenwashing route. We find the Obamas and Trudeaus of the world proclaiming something needs to be done, proclaiming we are taking great steps towards alleviating the problem proclaiming blah, blah, blah. By contrast, the far right speaks the truth. Not the scientific truth, of course, but rather the truth of the essential position of carbon capital. We will do anything within our power to delay the moment of the collective realization of the necessary dismantling of the carbon economy. 
all of Europe's far-right political parties are lined up with fossil fuel production and or consumption as one of their essential issues. Their emotionally powerful ideological identification with a notion of nation of course means white nation. But the carbon economy is also inextricably bound up with this. In Poland, for example, we have the concept of the white nation, but also the coal mining and burning nation. This is their zeitgeist. In Finland, it is the white and peat burning nation. And in France, you can find no greater hatred of wind power than that of Marie Le Pen's Front National. Fascists are not only indirectly funded by big oil, gas and coal, they are the shock troops for carbon capital. Chapter 4 War War is, of course, a significant part of our dystopian present and future trends. It is interwoven into complex feedback loops of causality and consequence with both climate change and the rise of fascism. Climate change will increasingly give rise to resource wars to do with energy and the very stuff of life, such as water. And this is already occurring. The resultant refugees of war and enviroeconomic failures stoke the fears and violence of fascists. Connected to all of these is the ultimate possibility of horror. Thermonuclear Armageddon. The Bulletin of Atomic Scientists now puts the doomsday clock at less than two minutes to disaster. 100 seconds to midnight. This aspect of dystopia is terrifying, but there is another war going on which needs a clear understanding. That is, we are already involved in the final total war for humanity's future. This bears repeating. We are in a condition of war at this very moment. The fact that most people are unaware of this only means that we are losing. Too many people and too much of the strategy for fighting this war is dominated by false understandings of the state of things. A significant segment of the ruling class, those directly involved with carbon capital, as well as those in related segments of financial capital, are consciously waging war against us. They are trading their present power and riches against humanity's future, against humanity having any future whatsoever. And they are doing so consciously. They know they are ruining our children and grandchildren's futures. As covered earlier in the film, Fossil fuel corporations are waging a multifaceted disinformation campaign concerning a number of aspects of climate change. They fund corrupt think tanks and political organizations. They outright buy politicians. But as significant as their legal and ideological campaigns are, perhaps even more significant is their ongoing action. The exploration, production and distribution and burning of fuel for the climate emergency as the proximity to the closing of all possible windows of mitigation to the emergency grows ever nearer, the need for an immediate slowdown of emissions becomes ever more urgent. Yet we are not breaking as we move toward the cliff edge we are accelerating. Who are the people making the decisions to ensure this is happening? It is that segment of capital, of the ruling class previously referred to. They are the enemy. They are worse than war criminals. They are worse than previous perpetrators of genocide. Because if not stopped, 
they will drive humanity into extinction. You often hear things said such as, man is killing the planet, or humanity is destroying the ecosphere. But this is incorrect. It is not humanity or even man. This suggests we all bear an equal responsibility. But in fact, it is a small number of people who are responsible. A very small number. Back in 2017, it was found that just eight men had as much wealth as that of the poorer half of the world, of 3.8 billion people. The eight wealthiest individuals on the planet then were Microsoft founder Bill Gates, with a net worth of 75 billion. Amancio Ortega, Spanish founder of Indintex, 67 billion. Warren Buffett, CEO and largest shareholder of Berkshire Hathaway, 60.8 billion. Carlos Slim Helu, founder of Mexican conglomerate Grupo Caso, 50 billion. Jeff Bezos, founder, chair and CEO of Amazon.com, 45.2 billion. Mark Zuckerberg, co-founder, chair and CEO of Facebook, 44.6 billion. Larry Ellison, co-founder and former CEO of Oracle Core, 43.6 billion. And Michael Bloomberg, founder, owner and CEO of Bloomberg Inc, 40 billion. But things have moved on since then. The share of wealth owned by the world's richest people soared during the COVID pandemic. The world's top 10 billionaires increased their wealth by $1.3 billion a day, or $15,000 a second during the global pandemic. These billionaires doubled their fortunes from $700 billion to $1.5 trillion and now have six times more wealth than the poorest 3.1 billion people. US billionaires own half a billion dollars more wealth than the bottom 60% or 197.6 million Americans. Elon Musk by himself has more wealth than the bottom 40% some 131 million Americans. These people, and a small number of others, the top corporate CEOs and CFOs, and the corrupt politicians they control, are our enemies. The fact that some of them are philanthropists is only a part of the ideological war we are losing. Oh, but look how much Billionaire X is giving to charity. Bill Gates is one of the most frequently referenced in this regard. He even suggests that the super rich need to be taxed more. Okay, then I'm starting to do a little math about uh, what I have left over. And aren't Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos cool? They are visionaries of humanity's future in space. No, they are not cool. They are guilty of ongoing crimes against humanity. They are criminals. They are the enemy. So what should be done? By us? Well, first of all, we should stop thinking in terms of persuasion. Rigorous logical argument and the presentation of sound empirical facts are not going to make them stop marshalling humanity's march to the end of the world. We have decades of the science being carefully and sometimes dramatically presented to no avail. 
the worldwide demonstrations have grown larger, yet it has made no difference. The world oligarchy does not care what we think or want. Perhaps demos, another 100,000 people larger, or even a million more people, will make the crucial difference. Perhaps not. We don't know. Protest is still worth doing, but more is required. More, yes, but what? The answer is both simple but difficult to say. The difficulty is not the difficulty of articulating an idea. The difficulty is that the articulation of some ideas could easily land you in prison. Kim Stanley Robinson wrote a book called Ministry for the Future, in which such ideas are entertained. In it, he puts forward two very different, but not mutually exclusive ideas for saving the planet. The first is called carbon quantitative easing. Economists are divided in their views about quantitative easing generally, let alone carbon quantitative easing. Many believe quantitative easing is just a complicated way for federal banks to simply print more and more money to pay for what is needed. Carbon quantitative easing would simply be a manner in which federal banks could pay carbon capitalists to allow the transition to a green economy. The enormous, as yet untapped, reserves of still in the ground oil, gas and coal would be paid for by the banks to leave it there. In other words, the fossil fuel companies and governments such as the OPEC countries, would receive money to restrict and ultimately shut down their greenhouse gas emissions and even capture some of the carbon already burned through initiatives such as tree planting and new artificial means of carbon capture and disposal. Capture and storage. Carbon capture and storage, or CCS, is a complex mining process whereby fossil fuel companies inject donations into the arseholes of politicians to delay climate action and let them keep making the ching ching. CCS entails two key stages capture and storage. In the capture phase, also known as state capture, fossil fuel interests infiltrate your government at every level so that we'll ignore scientists and keep approving new coal and gas projects. But don't worry, in the storage phase, we pay those fossil fuel companies billions of dollars to bury their emissions underground. Does it work? Absolutely. Those companies store the billions of dollars deep, deep down in their bank accounts where no tax officer can reach them. What's that? Do they store the carbon? Yeah, nah. CCS has missed every single target we've set for it. Regardless of one's position upon the potential and limits of quantitative easing, it is the argument of this film that such is not a viable solution. Why? Because it depends upon enlightened bankers working collectively and altruistically through global agreement. The bankers will save us. Seriously? Robinson's ministry's second possible solution originates in the horror of the climate disaster depicted in the opening of the book. So-called wet bulb conditions occur when heat and humidity are too high for sweat to evaporate. Such conditions can be fatal for humans if the temperature and humidity both exceed 95 degrees Fahrenheit or 35 degrees Celsius. Such conditions persisted in a region of India for over a month, resulting in the deaths of 20 million people. The event is portrayed powerfully and vividly in the book. Is such an event possible? Well, the destruction of Lytton BC, referred to earlier in this film, was a similar event, with the heat causing a fire. 
But the death toll was only measured in hundreds and nothing like the 20 million of the fictional disaster. Although such a climate change caused event has yet to occur in reality, the key word with respect to it is yet. The other aspect of it also seems disgustingly realistic as well. What dramatic economic changes and political initiatives occurred after the disaster? Essentially none. There were speeches by the politicians and conferences with diplomats and academics, but no real action. Essentially, there was only Greta's blah, 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 except the event and its aftermath gave birth to the children of Kali. This underground terrorist organization decided that direct action was called for. They proceeded with a multi-drone attack upon first 57 planes. And then a few days later, 29 more were shot down. The planes were chosen carefully as regards to being principally international business commute flights rather than tourist carriers. Regardless, the effect of these attacks was to drastically shut down international air travel. It didn't stop entirely, of course, but it greatly reduced it, as people decided travelling by air was simply too dangerous. The children of Kali also began sinking cruise ships. This effectively killed the cruise ship industry. There are two reality points to be made concerning this fictitious turn of events. First is the fact that the carbon footprint of cruise ships is much bigger than that of airplanes. Travelling to New York and back on the QE2, for example, uses approximately 7.6 times as much carbon as would making the same trip by air. A 2017 report says that a mid-sized cruise ship can use as much as 150 tonnes of fuel each day, which emits as much particulate as one million cars. The second point would be to consider the relative importance of cruise ships and planes to the carbon capitalist economy. The COVID world pandemic has given us a glimpse into the power of the airline industry. At the beginning of the pandemic, airlines were required by government edict to block off the middle seat in all tri-seat rows as an anti-contagion safety measure. But because of its cost to them, the industry forced governments to back off from such public health regulations. We can see air travel, and very crucially, air freight, as an essential to global fossil capitalism, in a way that the cruise industry simply is not. The luxury gluttony of the cruise industry could, we can imagine, simply be shut down by government fiat. But even what seems now like an unlikely reform to be initiated would be a long way from ensuring the necessary total energy and food green transition from our carbon economy. Stronger measures, importantly including strikes, would seem to be required to solve the emergency. Robinson's fictitious group, Children of Carly, goes directly in the face of virtually all eco-socialist organisations' commitments to non-violence, to that of most of the left's commitments generally. Robinson himself asserts that his novel would make a bad template for political action. One wonders if he actually believes this, or if he's simply covering himself from the dangers of potential criminal prosecution. The point of view of this film is that there is significant truth to be found in fiction. Regardless, it is now time to refer back to the argument made by Andreas Malm near the beginning of the film. He does not offer any practical instructions in bomb-making in his book, How to Blow Up a Pipeline. Rather, he gives us an argument on strategy. First, he surveys the ubiquitous nature of non-violence in green politics. 
Then he presents an overview of the effectiveness of this strategy, which he assesses at zero. Then he offers a differentiation between violence against persons and violence against property. Robinson's children of Carly, we can remember, engaged in both. Finally, Mom gives practical, political and moral argument that direct action sabotage, such as blowing up pipelines, for example, should be engaged in. He does not suggest that demonstrations and marches, etc., no longer be participated in, just that they may be supplemented by direct action. Such action is imminently ethical, indeed necessary, he argues, if we are to save humanity. We're in deep, deep doo-doo, and they've been telling us, the leading experts, for over 40 years. This is what we're come to. The next stage after this is there are going to be pipelines blown up if our leaders don't pay attention to what's going on. To make our final point of the film, we should look again at the Ministry for the Future. In it, the children of Kali conduct their most daring action and largest scale action. They take over Davos. Davos, Switzerland hosts the World Economic Forum's invitation-only annual meeting held at the end of January. It brings together chief executive officers from its 1,000 member companies, as well as selected politicians, representatives from academia, NGOs, religious leaders and the media. It has been referred to by some as the yearly strategy and tactics conference of the world's ruling class. This is something of an exaggeration, but nonetheless is a meetup of an incredible number of very powerful and influential people, including many corporate CEOs and presidents of countries. The children of Kali took over the entire town of 11,000, blocking all ways in or out of the mountain resort. They then subjected the Davos Conference delegates to a series of lectures and films and other presentations upon the political economy and the climate emergency. Robinson does not show this scene from the perspective of the children. Rather, he shows it from that of a Davos attendee. Such people were all initially terrified. They feared that they were about to be executed. Once this initial panic dissipated, however, most of them adopted their usual point of view of cynical amusement. They laughed at the earnestness of the Kali group's thoughts about changing the system. This reinforces the notion that continuing the politics of persuasion, at least persuasion of the powers that be, will continue to fail. Holding hands and singing Kumbaya will simply not cut it. Kumbaya. But of course, you need to educate, agitate and organize, but you also need to get angry. <laughs> No, really angry. A small number of people, two, maybe 3,000 people, are steering us towards the extinction of the human species, the deaths of your children and your children's children. <laughs>